I'm here today to present Drop the Rob, a fine grained control flow integrity for the Linux kernel. So, uh, how's it go? I mean, how's Black Hat? It's fun, right? So many gifts. <laughs> okay, so, uh, this work, uh, in this, in this presentation, I'm gonna introduce KCFI, which is, uh, de facto implementation of, uh, fine grained control flow integrity for the Linux kernel. And uh, this work was developed in collaboration between the uh, University of Campinas, which is my former university, uh, Columbia University and Brown University. And uh, it was developed by my, my colleagues here in Listed and uh, by me. I am uh, João Moreira. I'm a Brazilian dude here in Singapore. Uh, by the time we developed KCFI, I was a PhD candidate at the University of Campinas. Uh, currently, uh, I'm no longer a PhD student. Now I'm a PhD. Thanks God. <laughs> and I'm currently working as a live patching engineer at SUSE. So I'm still hacking the kernel uh, and doing stuff related to, I mean, kernel itself and kernel source code. So let's get it on. So uh, this is our agenda. This is basically what you're going to talk. Uh, first, we're going to do a quick review on kernel return oriented programming and check out why this is a thing. And uh, then I'm gonna give a quick look at control flow integrity, showing its limitation and the no issues regarding CFI. CFI is such like a big name currently, but we have to, to pinpoint what are the problems behind CFI. And then I'm gonna talk about KCFI itself, which is uh, our implementation. I'm gonna give some technical details regarding it. Then I'm gonna talk about uh, which are the improvements that uh, KCFI brings over uh, known. Uh, CFI issues and then you're going to talk a little bit regarding its performance. Okay, so uh, we have to start talking from the beginning and uh, because of that we have to talk about memory and safety bugs. And uh, as, you, as most of you might know, I mean memory, memory, memory bugs, memory problems may allow attackers to overwrite uh, code pointers. So uh, they may have control over code pointers be it like a function pointer or a return address which is on the stack. And uh, because of that, they can achieve something that we call control flow hijacking. So basically, they are able to achieve uh, arbitrary code execution. So imagine that there's like a function pointer in your memory, and uh, an attacker finds a bug that allows him to overwrite whatever value he wants in memory. Then he can uh, corrupt this this function pointer, which is in memory, and re redirect your code towards whatever he wants. Of course, uh, as this is a big issue. There are like many mitigations for this problem. So, uh, first, first mitigation, first well known mitigation is the right XOR execute policies. So, basically, this consists in whenever you have a memory page, this page is either writable or executable, but never both. So, by doing something like this, uh, you prevent an attacker, for example, to inject a malicious payload uh, in your data sections. So he's not gonna put code there which is this guy's this data and uh, then redirect control flow towards whatever he may have injected. So he, he's not allowed to do that anymore. We also have ASLR which is uh, address space layout randomization which basically consists in whatever, whenever you run your, your program, uh, the data structures and uh, the functions, they are in different memory positions and by doing that you prevent an attacker for uh, from uh, knowing the addresses of the things that he needs to corrupt or to f or from knowing where he needs to redirect control flow to. So uh, this is sort of left like some sort of obfuscation. Of course that there are also uh, ways to bypass these mitigations. So here we are talking first about cold reuse attacks. So cold reuse uh, will uh, basically exploit functions which are already uh, in your in your program so of course that you have a program you have executable code in this in its program so what an attacker will do he will basically use this code which is already in memory to perform his his deeds so uh, basically he this this memory pages which hold code they uh, are already marked as executable so uh, this this won't be a problem for him to redirect uh, code there also we have like memory disclosure uh, bugs that enable an attacker to read arbitrarily from memory and by doing that he's able to uh, infer which are the addresses that he needs to corrupt or places where he needs to point, to point the, the code pointers to. So uh, he's able to infer which is the randomization of set used by the ASLR and bypass this sort of protection. And specifically for the kernel setting, we have something that we call return to user attacks. 
So uh, imagine that an attacker controls a process which is in user space. So uh, he knows the addresses of everything inside this process. So and, and he also uh, is able to control uh, the page permissions in this process because he owns this process. And uh, since he he's able to do all that, whenever he can uh, exploit a bug in in the kernel space in the kernel in the kernel code, he can uh, redirect uh, the kernel execution flow towards the user space memory, thus bypassing both w uh, write XOR execute and the ASLR. So uh, this is a big thing. Of course that because of return to user uh, attacks uh, some ideas were also proposed and uh, the most prominent is the strong address space isolation which basically consists in preventing some sort of uh, abuses. So for example kernel code, I mean ker the kernel context is never supposed to execute instructions which are in the user space. So this is obviously something abnormal and should be prevented. So uh, because of that we have this implementations that uh, try to not allow this sort of thing. So uh, if you are in the kernel context and you are trying to run instruction which is in, in a memory page marked as a user space page, you're not going to be able to do it. So uh, this sort of thing is even implemented in hardware nowadays. You have Intel's uh, SMAP, which is a hardware extension for preventing this sort of abuse. But uh, because of, of these protections, because these protections are becoming really common, uh, attackers developed something called ROP, which is return oriented programming. And return oriented programming will basically uh, reuse uh, code. So it's, 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 a, a, uh, it's, a, it's a code reuse attack, but it's actually, we, we will reuse it in a special way to achieve Turing complete computation. So uh, as I said, it's going to reuse kernel code and uh, it's going to use uh, a concept that we call gadgets. So gadgets are actually uh, small instruction sequences which are ended by uh, an indirect branch. When we are talking about ROP you are normally talking about the return instruction. And uh, these gadgets can be freely chained through, uh, corrupt through corrupting the stack. So imagine that an attacker can uh, exploit a bug that allows him to overwrite your stack. And uh, He's going to put a lot of return address there, there as he wants to. And uh, he's going to redirect control flow to a gadget, which will run maybe one or two instructions and then run a return. When it's running a return, it's going to take uh, the next address from the stack, which is controlled by the attacker. Then it's going it's it, to, the execution flow will go to another gadget that will run one or two instructions and then run a rat and, and things like this. So he's basically reusing uh, the last instructions uh, on each function, which is already present on the code. So uh, let's see how it goes. So uh, we want to run a ROP attack to actually. Uh, bypass str uh, strong address space isolation. So basically, what we want to do is we want to disable strong address space isolation, and then we want to return into user space. So uh, imagine that an attacker has exploited a uh, memory corruption bug and overwritten the stack uh, with with the values that he wants. And uh, this first address, which is in the the top of the stack here, is the address of this gadget. This gadget is like a it's it's the less instructions in uh, in a function. So uh, what this gadget will do, it will first run a pop rocks, right? And uh, when it runs a pop rocks, what, what, what will it do? So execution was redirected there. So he will take the first uh, value on the top of the stack and put it inside rocks, right? So uh, basically rocks will contain the, the value that we call smap killer here. Uh, we call it smap killer because this value is the specific value that you must put into a control register to disable smap. So that's what we want to do. And uh, when it runs the red, uh, what's, what's it going to do? It will take the next address in the stack and red red control flow there. And now it's the address uh, of another gadget that will run uh, mov rocks inside CR4. And notice here that uh, CR4 is the control register that actually uh, controls if SMAP is on or off. So basically, we are setting the bits as we want. We are controlling CR4 by first controlling uh, rocks. And then uh, after, after disabling uh, SMAP, what we are going to do is we are going to run a red instruction. Uh, which we redirect uh, the control flow to the address of our payload, which is actually in user space. So uh, basically, this is how we get pawned. <laughs> okay. So, uh, what if we can find the indirect branches to save previously computed locations? So, this is basically the idea behind uh, control flow integrity. So, uh, 
the idea is originally indirect branches can redirect control flow to whatever they want, but uh, this, I mean, uh, uh, preventing this sort of thing, preventing this kind of permissiveness is what we want to avoid when we implement something like control flow integrity. So basically, we are going to find which are the addresses that uh, each each indirect target should point to, and we are going to enforce this. So uh, these paths, I mean, which are allowed, they are uh, defined by the application's control flow graph, and uh, of course that there are different methodologies for computing and enforcing this uh, control flow graph, like a CFG. So uh, we have many different implementations that that uh, enforce this kind of thing. Uh, if I'm trying to do something like this, if I'm trying to enforce paths to to a program to the indirect branches. What could possibly go wrong? Well, uh, first thing is a uh, relaxed permissiveness. So, uh, if you are enforcing paths for your program and you have a relaxed permissiveness, uh, the execution flow is going to be not very uh, determi uh, determinant. And uh, because of that, uh, attackers may still find paths that allow them to to exploit your program. Another problem, is of course, is coverage. So, uh, if you have uh, indirect branches which are not protected, then uh, you won't be able to to I mean to to protect these specific branches. Then attackers might be able to exploit that specific branch and that specific address. Also, uh, you have problems with false positives because I mean, if your control flow graph is too tight, I mean, if you if you don't predict. Uh, certain branches, then uh, your 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 system will raise false alerts and will tell you that uh, something that is not an attack is actually an attack, and you don't want that. So uh, first, speaking on granularity issues, uh, at C in CFI we have two major classifications. We have the coarse grained CFI schemes and the fine grained CFI schemes. So uh, imagine this situation here. So we have a function A which is calling a function B. So uh, on coarse grained CFI, which is more permissive, you have like a function B and a function C, and these two functions are actually allowed to return to the instruction, which is right after B, after they call B. So uh, in this scheme, I mean, you are not like enforcing that if this call is the call to the function B, only B can return here. No, I mean, whatever function may return to the instruction, which is right after a call. So uh, this is basically coarse grained CFI, and in fine grained CFI you have more a more detailed CFG. So basically, if you have a call to B here, you will not allow C to return here because I mean this is a call to B, so C is not allowed to return there, right? So uh, in fact, I mean coarse grained CFI is known to be bypassable. Researchers have shown that uh, this this kind of uh, protection is is bypassable, and you can actually uh, execute uh, code arbitrarily even under these circumstances. Okay, now talking about uh, KCFI, which is our implementation. It's a fine-grained CFI scheme for the Linux kernel. It's uh, instrument it's, it's it's based on instrumentation. We use uh, LLVM, which is a compiler for doing this instrumentation. Uh, the CFG that we use, that we enforce, it's computed statically. So basically, what we do is we do some sort of uh, source code analysis. We 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 run a, a full compilation round, doing analysis on the source code that we are we are actually compiling, and we figured out things like prototypes for pointers, prototypes for functions, and then on the generated binary, we run a binary analysis where we can figure out more stuff like solving uh, aliases, like uh, identifying which function is actually calling another function, how the inlining is is resolved by the compiler, and things like this. Okay, so uh, how exactly do we compute uh, a control flow graph? Uh, we have basically two two major major uh, problems here to solve. First problem are the backward edges. So we are talking about uh, return instructions. We need to know uh, which are the places to which a return instruction can return to. So uh, it's it's kind of easy to compute because all you have to do is to take a look at the final binary. So uh, if you have uh, a function A that calls a function B, you know that the function B must return to the function A whenever it's returning. So uh, it's it's kind of easy. It's it's already solved problem. Uh, but we also have the forward edges, which are like the indirect calls. And uh, for these cases, I mean, it's a little bit more complicated because a points to analysis is a mathematically uh, unfeasible problem, so it's, it's incomplete. You cannot just take a look at the source code and say, oh, this function pointer will call these, these, and these address. I mean, you, you cannot do, the, do that precisely. So uh, you have to do some sort of heuristics here. And uh, what we do is that, I mean, we 
uh, follow the approach which it, which was originally proposed by Abadi et al. I mean, uh, this is the guy who originally proposed CFI in 2005. Uh, he's a researcher from Microsoft Researcher, or was. I don't know if he's still there. But uh, in his approach, basically, what he says that if you have a function pointer. Uh, and this function pointer has a prototype. If you have a function, this function has a prototype, then uh, you enforce that these prototypes must match in a way for this call to happen. So uh, if you have, for example, a function which is void and receives no arguments, a uh, function pointer that, that is uh, void and receives no arguments, this function pointer can only be used to call functions which are uh, void and which will return void and receive no arguments. So you enforce this sort of matching. And by doing something like this, we are actually clustering functions by prototype. So uh, you have a specific prototype, all the functions on, on that same prototype will be allowed to be called uh, through that uh, function point pointer which matches this prototype. So uh, just to, to make it clear, we have an example here. So uh, we have this, this function pointer here which is a uh, FPTR. It, uh, it's a function pointer of the type that uh, returns a float and receives an int as an argument. And using this function pointer, we can call the function dog and the function cat because they have the same prototype. They are returning float and they are receiving an int as argument. But uh, you cannot use this function pointer to call the, the function fish because it is uh, it has a different prototype. Okay, so uh, I think it makes it clear. After building the CFG. Uh, we need to enforce it. So, uh, wh what do we do to enforce it? Then uh, we recompile the kernel code with uh, the CFG in place and we instrument the generated code with uh, whatever we need. So, uh, we're basically going to use two different uh, kinds of primitives for instrumentation here. First, I imagine this code here. I mean, uh, originally the, the original function only had this call, which happens through a register here, does it is uh, an indirect call. And uh, we want to protect this indirect call. So what are we going to do? Uh, I think you cannot see the, the word here very well, but try, try your best. <laughs> so uh, what we're going to do is, before actually calling uh, the, the, the value which is in the register, what we're going to do is, we're going to the reference, the value which is inside the address, add an offset of 4 in it just to bypass the opcode, uh, we'll go to it and see if the value which is there is actually a value that we expect. So uh, the functions that are allowed to be called through this uh, call instruction here, they have uh, as their first instruction an op instruction, which is an instruction that does not perform anything, but that actually in allows you to encode values inside of it. So this is actually working as a watermark. So uh, we are actually watermarking the functions on it on, on their first instruction. So we are putting a value there that's going to be checked before calling the instruction, um, uh, before calling the function uh, for that specific register. So uh, if this, this the value compared here match with the value which is here, then uh, this jump is taken. Uh, what makes the the control flow jump to here, and uh, then the call happens. If this is not the case, then uh, we are pushing the, the the value which was the referenced just just as an argument for a uh, violation handler function. And then we call uh, what we call a call violation handler, which is a function that we actually raise an alert and let your uh, sysadmin know that something nasty is going on. So uh, that's more or less how it happens. So uh, here we have a, what we call like a, a guard instrumentation and or a check, and here is what we call a tag. So this is a, a watermark instrumentation. After that, uh, we have. Uh, I mean, we also need to protect returns, as I said, and the instrumentation is pretty similar. Uh, so we have a call to function f1 here. Then we're going to put a tag right after the call, and uh, when f1 before before f1 uh, returns, it's going to run a check, which uh, first will load the address. I mean, the return address, which is in the topmost address of the stack, into a register, and then we're going to reference it and check if the the values match. If they do match, we do the jump here and return. If they do not match, we call the, the red violation handler. So the idea is pretty much the same, except that we need to load the the address from the, the stack because it's not it's not like in a, in an actual register that we are calling or something like this. So uh, is this approach really fine grained? I mean, is it like really safe or something? Well, uh, at least it is fine grained, and of course it is better than the coarse grained approach which were proposed in the past. But yet we can still do better. I mean, uh, we, we can do it a little bit uh, further. So uh, the, the presented scheme is actually prone to a problem that we identified and that we call transitive clustering relaxation. So uh, although this, this name is quite complex, the, the problem is really simple. So let's see what is it. Imagine that you have a target uh, for an indirect call. 
uh, which is called call it both directly and indirectly. So uh, as as this this targets for indirect calls as they are clustered, so uh, they will have all, all these functions will have the same tags on their prologs and, uh, and they will check for the same tags before returning. So imagine this situation: you have a function a which directly calls a function b, and you, you and, and you have a function c which has the same prototype of b. So uh, these two functions have the same prototype, thus they are clustered, and you have a call and b. Then uh, because because of the clustering thing. Uh, C can return to B because the, the tag that will be in A, uh, this could, uh, sorry, C can return to the B's call site in A because the tag which is in A is the same tag that B m will check when B is returning. So uh, you have an allowed edge here that was not supposed to exist, which is C returning to A. So uh, this is basically uh, the source code that describes the situation. You have a function A which calls B, then you have a tag here, and uh, you have another function. That uh, can call both B and C through a pointer, and uh, it must have the same tag here because this tag will be checked when this function is returned, right? So uh, both B and C must uh, check the same tag because they they both must return here. But the thing is, this is a direct call to B, even though C can still return there, right? So uh, this is something that we wanted to prevent because this is a necessary relaxation of our scheme. So uh, in our code base, uh, on the on the kernel configuration that we that we tested this thing, uh, only for the void with no arguments prototype, we have uh, 10,645 call sites with uh, 4,484 void functions. So uh, this is a lot. Even though I mean we still have other prototypes that add to that in terms of relaxation too. So uh, this this CFG this resulting CFG is quite permissive. So uh, yes, we we don't want that. We want to find a way to prevent that. So uh, the way we fix this is by uh, proposing a technique that we call uh, the call graph detection. So uh, call graph detection is is also really simple. Uh, so first thing we do is that uh, we identify the functions which are call uh, callable both directly and indirectly. Thus, we check the source code to see if there's a, a function pointer with uh, the prototype for that specific function and we also check the binary to see if that function is eventually called directly and uh, if this is the case we clone this function so we make a copy of this function in the resulting binary. And then uh, the direct calls to the function they are replaced uh, with calls to the clone so uh, th all the direct calls now will go to the clone and not to the original function and uh, the clone has a unique tag which is different from the cluster tag. So uh, this will result in something which is more or less like this. So uh, we have a function A, which now calls B clone, and we have this word that code here. We have uh, this Z function that can call both B and C uh, through the pointer. Thus, they will put the the tag for the prototype here, and uh, both B and C they still check for the same uh, for the same tag before returning. But uh, now we have a B clone here that checks for a different tag, and uh, the B clone is actually who is being called uh, on on A. So actually, C is no longer uh, allowed to return here. So uh, that's more or less how we solve this this uh, transitive clustering relaxation problem. So uh, by doing this, we the allowed call sites reduce it to 220 for indirectly called void functions. So as you can see, this is a meaningful uh, optimization. I mean, we we did uh, so some advancement here, and uh, of course, this happens because we have no more transitiveness. Uh, something else which is important and that we did implement in KCFI is the support for assembly code. If you don't support assembly code, then uh, first thing you're going to get a lot of po false positives. Because if you are indirectly calling assembly assembly code, you won't have the tags there. Also, if you have assembly code calling C functions, you won't have the tags there. Thus, uh, the checks will uh, raise the false alerts. Also, uh, and even worse, the indirect branches in the assembly code will be unprotected, and uh, this may be uh, a tar a target for attackers to exploit your system. So uh, you have to support that. What we do is that I mean we wrote like a bunch of parsers in Lua. Lua for those who don't know is a great language developed by Brazilian guys so I really approve it. <laughs> it's a uh, Lua based uh, parsers that we, we implemented to automatically rewrite source code. So uh, what we do is 
We have these parsers, we feed the assembly code to the parsers, and we automatically rewrite it, placing the proper tags wherever they should be. Uh, we, re we replace a few uh, macros in the kernel that, for example, in the kernel you have a macro called entry, which is used to mark the beginning of an assembly function. Then we have like a, a new macro that we call entry CFI that also marks the beginning of a function but uh, also places the tag there and things like this. So uh, we do all this sort of tricks. And of course, there are a few handcrafted fixes that we needed to solve by hand because uh, the kernel code is kind of weird and uh, you have like code which is generated by macros and uh, lot, lots and lots and lots of very known uh, pattern uh, recognizable approaches. We evaluated this thing uh, with three benchmarks. First, uh, we instrumented spec 2006 with uh, KCFI, so we compiled it with the checks. And we verified uh, an average of 2% uh, overhead on it. Of course, this is not very representative because uh, spec, spec is very CPU intensive. So uh, you don't have like many branches there. So uh, we are, you're not really uh, stressing your mechanism. So uh, something else we did is like we compiled the kernel with the protections and then uh, we did execute uh, LM bench on top of this kernel. The uh, LM bench is like a micro benchmark. So, uh, as a micro benchmark, it is expected that it will have like very high overheads. Sorry, it's a, it's a micro benchmark. Uh, it's expected that it will have like very, very, uh, lar very large overheads. So, as a micro benchmark, uh, what it will do, it will basically run a, a syscall or just like a TCP uh, functionality or something very simple, which is a uh, functionality from the kernel. And uh, we have seen an, an average of 8% overhead on it. And uh, we also did run uh, Pharonix on top of this uh, instrumented kernel. Pharonix. It's actually the, the macro benchmark. So uh, basically what Phronix is, Phronix has a bunch of servers like HTTP servers, FTP servers. It has applications that will compress a file and do uh, tasks which resemble more what you do in your daily uses on a server or on a computer. So uh, it's expected that this kind of benchmark will have a, a lower overhead because it will run more code in user space which is not instrumented. So uh, we, we have seen a 2% overhead on average for this one. And uh, of course I can provide more details regarding the benchmarks. I have some slides uh, about it on the, on the back part of the slides. Uh, I just don't want to go into unnecessary detail now. Of course that uh, fine grained CFI is not perfect either. So uh, last year some, some guys proposed, I mean they, they have presented this, this papers in Usenix and CCS uh, showing that there are cases where CFI is too uh, vulnerable to attacks. Of course that uh, these, these attacks are very specific and very constrained. And uh, there's like a, there, there's this uh, non controlled data attacks, which are attacks that actually may allow an attacker to run uh, code arbitrarily, but they're not re literally like targeting uh, controlled data, like function pointers or, or return addresses, for example. And uh, here in Black, Black Hat Asia, I think we have two talks regarding it. I think that there was one talk. Uh, right before before mine, that was uh, regarding Microsoft Edge, and there's going to be another talk tomorrow. So uh, this is sort of like a trend in the academia. I mean, these guys are looking for different ways of uh, exploiting systems, even though they are using uh, KCFI, as more and more people are using KCFI daily. So uh, the complexity, actually, actually the complexity behind these methods, they showed that uh, CFI is actually a relevant method. So, I mean, these attacks are quite complex. We don't know if they're like really uh, usable on a daily basis. We, none of these attacks have ever been shown for the kernel setting, so uh, I don't know, I mean, this at least shows that uh, CFI is a meaningful protection. Possibly more meaningful than ASLR. Okay, so now uh, let's go see a demo. Uh, I'll try to run it live, but of course, I'm, uh, I am an unlucky guy. Things go wrong with me all the time. So uh, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to run a uh, kernel here which is uh, instrumented with KCFI. And uh, I have like a, a handcrafted uh, exploit in this thing and uh, I'm able to control a function pointer through uh, a synthetic export or something like this. So uh, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to log into this machine. <coughs> And I'm going to uh, overwrite this function pointer. Are, are you guys able to read? Do you need to bigger, larger font or something? Larger? Okay. Um, 
I just don't know where to do it. <laughs> Sorry? Command plus? Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I'm actually learning something here. Now, is, is it better? Want bigger? Okay. So uh, basically, we have this uh, three interfaces that I have created through the bugfs here, and uh, whenever I put some uh, value inside over func pointer, this is going to actually replace a function pointer which is running on kernel. And whenever I put something on invoke function, this function pointer will be invoked. So it is not really an exploit, but uh, it, it it will show us what we want to see. So uh, I also uh, changed my module to show me which are the addresses of the functions which I want to check because I'm lazy. So uh, we have these two functions. One, one, one is called allowed. Allowed has the same prototype of the function pointer that we are going to corrupt. And uh, not allowed does not have the same prototype. It has a different prototype does it may raise an alert. So uh, what I'm going to do first is that I'm going to put the address of allowed inside the function pointer. And uh, now I'm going to invoke it And I'm going to run the mask, and uh, see uh, we we executed the function here and here, and uh, there was like no no alerts raised. Now I'm going to execute the not allowed function, and I'm going to show you that uh, when the prototype is different, the scheme really works. But before doing that, I want to show you like uh, really how this thing works. So I'm going to plug GDB into the kernel and do a step-by-step -step execution of the the whole thing. So uh Okay, now I just plug it into the GDB as you can see it's paused. So uh I'm going to dis dis uh disassembly the function invoke function which is the function which uh will be called whenever we we do that echo one into invoke func and uh the call which is actually being uh, exploited is happening uh right here. So uh this call uh which happens through RAX. As you can see the, the instructions on top of it are actually those instructions which I showed I showed earlier for the instrumentation. And um okay so I'm I'm going to put a breakpoint right here and put the kernel to run. I'll have to log in again because kernel was stopped and uh, the connection dropped. Uh, and now I'm going to put the address of the function which is not allowed into the over function pointer interface. And now I'm going to invoke this, this function pointer which is going to trigger the, the breakpoint on the other screen. So uh, just like I said. So uh, first thing we have here is instruction which is actually uh, Loading the address, I mean the, the, the value which is in the register, which will be used for the indirect call, into RCX. Okay, so uh, RCX now holds the address which will be used for 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 calling, right? So uh, what we are going to do is that what I'm going to show you is that I'm going to show you what is there. So we are going to the reference it, just like it's going to be done in this in this specific instruction here. So uh, we have to the reference this address. But the thing is, as I told you before, uh, this this word is encoded inside an op instruction. So we have to do uh, to, to add a small offset to it, just to bypass the op code, which is an offset of four. And then uh, we see that it actually holds the value 0710075a. If we uh, disassembly the not allowed function, we can see that the same value is is in the first instruction of the function. So actually. Uh, as as the CMP instruction is actually looking for a different value, uh, the value which is which is it is looking is nine one two f five two two seven. Then this, this is not going to be a, a match. So uh, if we run uh, a step here, we are, we are going to the jump on equal instruction, and uh, but but the thing is not is not equal, right? So uh, as you can see here, and in, in the debugger, the jump will not be taken. 
So we're going to go to the next instruction. The jump was not taken. Now we are going to push this this instru this this value of the the indirect call into the stack, and uh, then we are going to call the call violation handler. The call violation handler is a really simple function. I mean, you can implement it however you want. Currently, it's only programmed to give you an alert. So I'm just gonna hit continue here, and the uh, code is, is now running again. And uh, when I log in again, if I run a DMAS here, uh, as you can see, there's this uh, CFIC, which is actually the, the let's say, acronym for a CFI uh, call violation or something like this. And we have these two addresses, which is the address that triggered the, the violation and the address which was being called by the triggered violation. So we were able to map what exactly the guy was trying to run when he did this, this pointer corruption. So, uh, and of course, I mean, uh, we did not block the function, but we could have done this inside the violation handler, and uh, the function just printed that this function should not be allowed. Uh, as the, the tag after the function pointer was also different from the tag inside the not allowed function, we also have like a return violation that was triggered here, and well, uh, that's it. That's pretty much how the, the scheme works. We could see it like step by step. Uh, now back to the slides. I hope my friend Trump liked it and does not block me from joining the USA again. Okay, so uh, what are the conclusions that we have here? So fine grained CFI in the OS context is achievable. Uh, I think I think this is cool because the guys that presented right right before me they just had the same sound bite you know like oh actually doing a SSH covered channel through caches is achievable so I think that most people are here trying to prove stuff that's that's cool we proved the stuff awesome work guys <laughs> so uh, CFI can be used to provide a meaningful level of protection as we as we can see by the complexity of the attacks which are actually targeting uh, CFI. And it will push attackers for more constrained and complex exploitation techniques. Uh, also, uh, current existing methods for refining granularity in CFI, they can and they must be improved. So as, as I have shown you, uh, call graph detaching is like a, this is a new technique, nobody have proposed that before. And by doing that we actually uh, refine significantly uh, the, the, the fine grained CFI schemes. So uh, I guess that's it. I think I was like super fast. So uh, we have like a thousand hours for. I mean, I don't have like a very cool quest, cool, cool song like they do, but we can sing one here. <laughs> Go on, guy. Yeah. For every boot. Yeah. Is it, uh, if they are randomized or something. Yeah. No. no I mean, uh, they are not randomized because uh, we don't. It, it doesn't matter. I mean. Uh, we, we, the scheme that we, that we implemented, we, we did not rely on secrecy. I mean, uh, the idea is that uh, even though we were able to, to disclose memory, I mean, uh, the tags and the verifications will still there, so we won't be able to redirect code, uh, whatever you want to. I mean, uh, we, we are considering that uh, a threat model where, for example, in your kernel, the guy won't be able to inject executable code into your memory. So, I mean, uh, if he's able to put, to put data there, it's data. It's not uh, marked as executable. So uh, he will not be able to to uh, bypass this kind of thing. Go ahead. Uh, okay, protect calls from violation handlers. Uh, it would be required if uh, we had a f because I mean it's a direct call, so the violation handler is eventually returning, and uh, there could be like a, a bug. Uh, inside the violation handler, uh, that would be would, would allow uh, somebody to corrupt the return from the violation handler. Yeah, it could be possible, but what I'm considering is that as my violation handler is really simple and uh, very very tight, that there's not a bug there. But definitely yes. I mean, if if uh, if there's a bug inside the violation handler, the guy will be able to corrupt the. The, the return from the violation handler, but here comes something, right? So the violation, violation handler was already invoked, so the sysadmin already knows that something is happening. So, uh, and whenever the violation handler is returning, the guy would maybe uh, get the control of, of, of the system or. or yes, sort of. <laughs> In, introspection. Please. 
What do you mean by intro handlers? So, sorry, I could not understand. Uh, can you talk a little bit louder? Sorry, I, I still not not able to understand your question. Uh, no, 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 please. I, I want I want to I want to go for it. A hardware interruption. Okay, so uh, whenever I have like a hardware interruption, so uh, thing is the the kernel will start executing through uh, through like a, a NIC gate or something like that, and uh, it starts executing normally. So uh, we don't really uh, verify if the, the the interruption is really running uh, through let's say a protected a protected gate or something like that. So we just assume that okay there's a hardware interrupt here then uh, we have like uh, the, the interrupt handler here the interrupt handler starts executing here. So uh, we assume that this is safe because uh, we don't know much of much of how an attack would be able to to protect against this. And then uh, this handler starts executing and uh, imagine that you have like another interrupt that will uh that will start executing. That's what you call like an, an interruption, an interruption handler so, right? So the thing is we, this scheme does not really rely on the context of the execution. So, uh, that, that execution flow just stops and I mean it's just frozen just like it happens normally on the kernel and the new thread starts ex executing and it's irrespective to the previous one. So this code is, this new code will just start executing and whenever it's calling uh, new uh, functions indirectly or returning I mean this will be already solved. So, I mean, it's not re really a problem to freeze one execution and start executing another one. So uh, the whole scheme is, is already, uh, let's say, compliant with with interruption uh, requirements. Anyone else? <laughs> okay, so uh, we have like a slide about it here, somewhere. Um. So okay, so uh, for KCFI, uh, we fault the CGD optimization. We have like a two percent space overhead, and we are talking about a kernel that has a uh, 718 megabyte. So uh, it, it it raised it to 718 megabyte from 705. If we do the CGD optimization, then we our cloning functions do, does the overhead is 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 bigger. Then we get like a four percent space overhead. So uh, just just to, to let you know, I mean uh, the code the code base we used had like uh, 132,972 functions, and uh, we cloned uh, seven, 17,000 uh, functions, 17,779. So uh, in terms of numbers, it's considerable, but uh, still not that much size overhead. Of course, that uh, I, I don't know. Something I would like to assess sometime is like if this uh, has a meaningful impact in uh, in power consumption. Because I mean, uh, when we talk about uh, size overhead, we eventually end up talking about embedded devices or something like this. And these guys have a, uh, a special criteria for uh, for uh, power consumption. And uh, I know that, for example, having the the CGD optimization is something that will harm at least slightly your your cache. Because uh, you're, if you if you were calling the same function indirectly and directly, I mean the same code would be in the cache and uh, it would be a cache hit. But now that you have like detached these things, I mean your cache considers these things to be different, so uh, it, it won't be a cache hit anymore. So I would like to see it sometime. I just did not it yet. Please. Uh, we 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 implemented it specifically for the x86 64 architecture. Uh, so uh, we the the x86 architecture has a few a few features that we use. For example, the tags that we used, uh, which I showed you, they're implemented as uh, they're not here. So they're implemented as as not L instructions, right? So uh, not L instructions. Uh, they're not like available. I mean, the, the instructions they are available in in most architectures, but not of, not all of them will allow you to encode the value inside of it. So uh, this is something that we are able to achieve in the x86 64 architecture. So I believe that uh, for other architectures, of course, there's going to be different constraints, but uh, I think that currently the most uh, the most uh, let's say 
break that f for for implementing this thing into a different architecture would be having a way for uh encoding tags properly we, we actually i mean we know a different way of encoding tags which actually consists in declaring a global variable in the kernel and then y and then doing a mov instruction inside this global variable so uh the value which is being moved is the tag and uh, the global variable uh is never going going to be used so it's it's just a way to do a dummy mov with a value that we want to be there but uh the problem is this scheme causes more cache contention this scheme uh will harm your performance more strictly than using ops but i mean this is a way for example to implement this thing on a different uh on a different architecture uh another thing which is which is interesting is that uh, higher level caches they are inclusive so uh one thing is, is that for example when you were referencing an address for for verifying if, the, if a tag is there then uh, if 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 this this address which you're the reference is not in the cache then uh, what's going to happen is that it's, it's going to come into the cache as data so it's going to be probably in in L2 if if I'm not wrong at least and then when you're jumping to this instruction to execute it then uh, it's going to be loaded from L2 cache and not from from the memory itself so uh, the scheme considering the intel's uh, architecture for caches is is really efficient i'm i'm not sure how it would perform on different architectures more questions okay great then Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your time.